Welcome to Lumos Maxima, the Rolling Library Podcast. My name is Demi Schwartz, a Hufflepuff. My name is Jessica Minecci, a Ravenclaw. It's time to turn on the light because Hogwarts is about to welcome you home. Hello everyone, welcome to episode 8 of Lumos Maxima. We're super excited to be back again. Yes, we are. And for those of you who don't follow us on social, our social media handles are at Lumos Maxima Cast on Instagram and Twitter and Lumos Maxima, the Rolling Library podcast on Facebook. We also have a YouTube channel, which is Lumos Maxima, the Rolling Library podcast, where we post bonus content. So please subscribe if you haven't already. We also have a voicemail line, which is 412-228-5435. So hit us up and leave us a voicemail. It will be featured in a future episode. Awesome. Demi, do you want to tell everybody what our topic is for episode 8? You guys, I've been waiting for this day for so long because we're finally talking about Neville Longbottom, my favorite. (laughs) And we have a very, very special guest with us, Tiffany from Swish and Flick. Hello. (laughs) It's it's super nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. We're so excited to have you. Thanks. So, um, yeah. So, like they said, I am on Switch and Flick podcast, and I am the Gryffindor host. And if you go by Ilvermorny in any kind of capacity, I'm also a horned serpent, (laughs) which I guess kind of makes sense because horned serpents are supposed to be of the mind. And my second house is Ravenclaw. Although a lot of people tell me it should be Slytherin. <laughs> my wand is Hazelwood, Phoenix Feather Core, nine and three quarters inches, reasonably supple flexibility. My Patronus is an Osprey, which is a bird of prey, which pretty much fits me. I am small but fierce. <laughs> My favorite book is Deathly Hallows. My favorite character is Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. I love how you said his whole name. I know. That's great. Well, he's my guy, you know. (laughs) But I think if I were at Hogwarts, my favorite class would be Charms. I love Deathly Hallows and I love Charms. I just finished Deathly Hallows again. It was, it's just so good. It's so good every single time. And every single time I read it, I definitely pick up something new. Me too. Every time. Yeah, that's what makes me happy is that this series ended in such a good way because some series don't and this series is just, that's just how awesome it is. Yeah, I agree. So thank you for introducing yourself, Tiffany. We're super excited to have Tiffany back with us for our Tales of Magic and Mischief segment to talk all about Neville. But right now, let's get into our quote. It's time for Quick Quotes Corner. The quote I picked for Neville comes from chapter 36 of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows called The Flaw in the Plan. In one swift, fluid motion, Neville broke free of the body-buying curse upon him. The flaming hat fell off him, and he drew from its depths something silver with a glittering, rubied handle. The slash of the silver blade could not be heard over the roar of the oncoming crowd, or of the sounds of the clashing giants, or of the stampeding centaurs. And yet, it seemed to draw every eye. With a single stroke, Neville sliced off the great snake's head, which spun high into the air, gleaming in the light flooding from the entrance hall. And Voldemort's mouth was open in a scream of fury that nobody could hear, and the snake's body thudded to the ground at his feet. So this moment when Neville kills Nagini, the last Horcrux, is hands down his bravest and most heroic moment. Throughout the series, Neville grows into a strong leader and true Gryffindor. It's interesting to imagine how Neville could have been the chosen one if Voldemort would have marked him as his equal instead of Harry. In his own way, Neville still played an important role in defeating Voldemort, and with the prophecy in mind, killing Nagini has been part of Neville's destiny all along. It's interesting how Harry's life could have been Neville's, And their lives are still intertwined now because they both defeat Voldemort. Also, they both are brave and loyal people, and they are leaders among their peers. I love how you said that they're both leaders because at the beginning of the series, Harry comes into the whole magical world knowing nothing, and Neville 
doesn't have the best magical abilities at the beginning. So in a way, they're both kind of not the best students at the start. They're not as strong and they're not seen as the leaders at the beginning that they become at the end. So it's interesting how both of them being intertwined with this prophecy and seeing how they both become true Gryffindors and true leaders. You're right to me and also think about how they both used the sword of Gryffindor. Yes, I love that because as Dumbledore said, only a true Gryffindor could have pulled that out of the hat. And wait, I hear something. Jess, do you hear something? Yeah, I do. I think it's Polly with our wizarding news. Hey, it's Polly, our owl. She's bringing us the wizarding news in the muggle world. Thank you so much, Polly. Let's look at what she brought us. Friday, June 26, 2020 was the 23rd anniversary of the publication of the first Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's slash Sorcerer's Stone. To celebrate, many people tweeted about this and used the hashtags hashtag 23 years of Harry Potter, and hashtag 23 years of magic. This next piece of news is super exciting. Warner Brothers Consumer Products has partnered with several different licensees to create Harry Potter themed face coverings for people of all ages. A variety of Wizarding World prints will be available including wands, Hogwarts houses, characters, and iconic imagery from the Harry Potter series. Part of the proceeds from mask sales will go to charities actively supporting first responders, underserved communities, and those impacted by the spread of COVID-19. Stay tuned for more information about how to purchase your Harry Potter face covering. For all of you gamers out there, this last piece of news is really cool. Harry Potter Wizards Unite is one year old. The mobile app Harry Potter Wizards Unite is an augmented reality game that allows players to interact with their surroundings through a Wizarding World lens. Wizarding World has provided us with some interesting stats from the game's first year of play. This game has 5 billion traces returned, 850 million potions consumed, 400 million kilometers walked, 2 billion visits to points of interest, 275 million Wizarding Challenges won, and 150 million gifts sent to friends. The fun is just beginning. Players can look forward to even more new features coming next month. Visit HarryPotterWizardsUnite.com to learn more. Now, let's go to Demi with Neville News. All right, all right, all right. It is Neville news time, and I'm super excited to talk about my fave. So Neville was born on July 30th, 1980. He is an only child and the son of Frank and Alice Longbottom, two outstanding aurors who were tortured with the Cruciatus curse by Bellatrix Lestrange. They were institutionalized at St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries when Neville was an infant, and it is for this reason why he was brought up by his grandmother, Augusta. Neville's grandmother and the rest of his elderly extended family believed that he was a squib because he didn't show any magical abilities until he was 8 years old. Neville is a Gryffindor and in Harry's year at Hogwarts. He initially uses his dad's wand, but after it breaks in the Battle of the Department of Mysteries, he gets his own wand which was made by Ollivander. This wand is cherry wood with a unicorn hair core. Neville has a toad named Trevor which was given to him as a gift from his great uncle Algie when Neville showed magical talent for the first time. At school, Neville is often forgetful and struggles with magic. He particularly has a difficult time in potions and also his bogart happens to be Snape. On the other hand, Neville excels at herbology. Neville really starts to grow in his fifth year. When he joins the DA, he gains confidence and is able to perform a handful of defensive spells. He fights in all the major battles in the Second Wizarding War, the Battle of the Department of Mysteries, the Battle of the Astronomy Tower, and the Battle of Hogwarts. Most of all, he kills Nagini with the Sword of Gryffindor. After the battle, Neville, along with Harry and Ron, are recruited to join Kingsley Shacklebolt's progressive government as ours to clean up the department and finish the job of ending Death Eater power once and for all. After his Hogwarts years, Neville becomes the herbology professor and he marries Hannah Abbott. 
So that's a little bit on Neville. And now let's talk a little bit about Matthew Lewis, who plays Neville in the movies. I actually met him at Soul City Con in Pittsburgh a couple years ago. And yes, there were a lot of tears and hugs, but it was fantastic. Neville may be a Gryffindor, but Matthew is a Hufflepuff, and this is super ironic because Neville tried to convince the Sorting Hat to put him in Hufflepuff for so long that he was almost considered a hat stall, so I think it's super funny that Matthew is a Hufflepuff. The same can't be said for Matthew though, because when he got sorted into Hufflepuff, he wasn't super thrilled about it. But it all changed when he found out that Dwayne Johnson, aka The Rock, is also Hufflepuff. Now I have some hilarious tweets for you after Matthew found this out. If this is legit, I take back everything I ever said about being a Hufflepuff. I was obviously born to be in that house. It gets even better because then he tweeted, I just wish at the rock was my Patronus. And Dwayne Johnson replied and it's fantastic. So this is what he said. Hell yeah, I will in fact be the guardian of everyone's most powerful positive feelings. Can my Patronus be a silverback at JK underscore rolling? So this is just fabulous. I'm going to wrap up my Neville news with an interview that Matthew did with CNN in July of 2011 after Deathly Hallows Part 2 hit screens across America. In the first question of the interview, Matthew was asked about what lessons he learned from portraying Neville's journey of personal growth in the movies. Oh wow, the great thing about Neville, what message he conveys that J.K. Rowling wrote for him, was that you can have any kind of disadvantage at the start of your life and it doesn't define you. You can still go on to be whoever you want to be. As long as you have friends around you and you have a belief in doing the right thing, you can go on to be a hero. It doesn't matter what humble beginnings you came from. I think that's really inspiring. I think that's a really nice life lesson. I couldn't thank Matthew enough for saying this because this is the reason why I love Neville so much and I couldn't have said it better myself. On that note, it is time to get into our Neville discussion with our fabulous guest, Tiffany from Swish and Flick. Now, it's time to dive into the book topic of the week for tales of magic and mischief. The time has come, it's Neville discussion time. So we're gonna start off with Sorcerer's Stone and the first time we see Neville in the book is at platform nine and three quarters. And of course, he lost Trevor the Toad. And Harry passes him when he's trying to find a seat on the train and says, Gran, I lost my toad again. So obviously, at the beginning of the book, this is something that is repeated because on the Hogwarts Express, he loses his toad again and Hermione is being nice and helping him look for it. And then once they get to... Hogsmeade Station and they're going up to Hogwarts when they're taking the boats across the lake he leaves Trevor behind and Hagrid being the amazing person that he is realizes that Neville locked, left his toe behind and got it for him. So I feel like introducing Neville in this way is really important because at the beginning of the series he is seen as the character that's really forgetful He's really sensitive, and this is a good way to introduce him because losing his toad is something that happens frequently. Yeah, it kind of sets you up um, to think that he's a certain way, and it also lays a really good like groundwork for his character arc. Yeah, 100%. So the next thing we see is Neville's sorting. When Neville Longbottom, the boy who kept losing his toad, was called, he fell over on his way to the stool. The hat took a long time to decide with Neville. When it finally shouted, Gryffindor, Neville ran off still wearing it, and he had to jog back amid gales of laughter to give it to McDougal Morag. So again, poor Neville is making a fool out of himself in front of the whole school because he's so nervous. Mm. He's super jumpy and he's stressed out about his sorting and yeah, he just is a hot mess right now. <laughs> I think it's super interesting that Neville could have been in Hufflepuff because he has a lot of the qualities that Hufflepuff has, such as loyalty. But as we will see later, his bravery really shines. And I think that's why the sorting hat is so brilliant because he's able to see the entirety of a person's mind and also what they're capable of. Yeah. Yeah, and Neville was actually almost a hat stall, which is basically when a Hogwarts student sorting takes more than five minutes. And 
Neville was asking a hat to put him in Hufflepuff and they went back and forth for quite a while until the sorting hat was basically like, nope, you're going to Gryffindor. Yeah, like almost, almost true hat stalls. So there's only been like a few like true hat stalls within Hogwarts history. And so when you think about like a hat stall and they take so long to figure out what house you go into, I often wonder like, is there any part of the sorting hat that is like... I know I say this all the time, but like a seer or can like sense what will happen in the future with someone. And we know that um, students are sorted based on like what they value. So like Neville, in his case, he really values people who are brave because that's what he's constantly trying to live up to. Yeah, I agree. And I also think that your sorting also reflects the house that you aspire to be so neville is clearly a a loyal person he could clearly go in hufflepuff but because bravery is a quality that is within him that needs built that's why he's in gryffindor because that that will help him achieve it it's a good point so when the feast starts all the first years are kind of talking about their families whether they're pure blood half blood muggle-born and ron asks neville about his family And this is what Neville says. Well, my grand brought me up and she's a witch, but the family thought I was all muggle for ages. My great uncle Algy kept trying to catch me off my guard and force some magic out of me. He pushed me off the end of Blackpool Pier once. I nearly drowned, but nothing happened until I was eight. Great uncle Algy came round for dinner and he was hanging me out of an upstairs window by the angles when my great auntie Enid offered him a meringue and he accidentally let go. But I bounced all the way down the garden and into the road. They were all really pleased. Gran was crying. She was so happy. And you should have seen their faces when I got in here. They thought I might not be magic enough to come, you see. Great uncle Algy was so pleased he bought me my toad. So I feel like this shows so much about his family and why he's a little bit more nervous, I think, than the other first years because he had this pressure on him to be magical because his parents were great wizards, great oars, and because he didn't show magic till a very late age, they doubted his magical abilities. And also, I'm not too happy about his great uncle Algy here because if Neville wouldn't have been magical. Dropping him out of an upstairs window by accident or not, Neville would have been badly hurt and he could have even died. So I just, mm, I can't with how he's treated, even by his family. Yeah, some things that uh, wizards and witches do are quite questionable. And I think like reading this as a kid, I was like, oh my gosh, that's hilarious. And then like rereading it as adult, I'm like, dude, that's not funny at all. No. (laughs) There are other ways I'm sure he could have found out whether or not Neville had any kind of magical ability. So Neville's first year at Hogwarts does not start well because he has a potions lesson with Snape. All the first years are put into pairs to make a simple potion to cure boils and Neville is paired up with Seamus. And Neville makes a mistake and ends up melting Seamus' cauldron into a twisted blob. And all the potion starts to go everywhere and Neville gets it all over him. He has boils on his arms and legs and Snape, instead of, you know, acknowledging the fact that, okay, he's new, he might make mistakes. What he says is, idiot boy, which is just terrible. And then Neville starts to get more boils on his face and on his nose. And Seamus takes him off to the hospital wing. So this is the moment that really starts the whole fear with Snape. It starts the way that Snape treats him. And we definitely see this throughout the whole series. Yeah, absolutely. I often wonder, too, like, because the prophecy could have obviously been Neville or Harry. And so we literally talked about this when we were recorded last night for Swish in um, Order of the Phoenix. We're talking about how when Snape relayed the prophecy to Voldemort, do you think that maybe Snape was like thinking it was Lillian James and kind of led Voldemort in that direction, not on purpose? Like, what do you think about that? We thought about that last night, and I was like, what? 
I think so, in a way, because of his connection with Lily. But, and it's just also really interesting because I feel like because of the way that Snape treats Neville, it's a kind of reflection of, well, Voldemort could have killed Frank and Alice instead. And if he would have went for Frank and Alice and shot to kill Neville, then nothing would have happened to Lily. So it could have kind of been like a well, I am i don't like Neville because he wasn't the one that almost got killed and Voldemort didn't go for his parents. He went for Lily. Yeah. Like, isn't that just... That's bananas. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's so... I never thought of that before. In a way, maybe it's maybe it's good that he... Like, I'm not saying it was good that he Voldemort killed Harry's parents, but I'm saying maybe in a way it was... It was a better option to take Harry because... Harry's a little bit more powerful than Neville is. And, you know, we don't know if Neville would have been able to take on Voldemort at the end. But then again, that's, like, up to conjecture. Like, would, would have he, would he have been able to if he, he had been chosen? Yeah, and then you have to think about the choices that Alice would have made that night as well. And Harry even thinks that. He said, you know, would Neville's mother have stood in between and and died to protect her son and he said i think harry thought like surely she would have so i mean there's a lot of different moving pieces to that but it's a very interesting thought to think yeah definitely it's super super interesting i never really thought of that before so my mind's already blown and we're like only on the first book (laughs) so neville's start to hogwarts doesn't get any better because then later on he has a flying lesson and that morning is when the whole Draco bullying starts because he comes over and takes Neville's Marimbral and then luckily McGonagall comes over and makes him give it back to Neville but then at the flying lesson poor Neville has never been on a broom and he gets all jumpy and anxious and he kicks off the ground really hard before Madame Hooch blows a whistle and loses control of the broom and he falls and breaks his wrist and When he gets taken away to the hospital wing, Draco thinks it's funny to kind of make fun of him along with the other Slytherins. He takes Neville's Remembral and thinks he's going to leave it up in a tree for him to get. But obviously we know Harry saved the day here and goes after Draco on the broom and catches the Remembral and makes it onto the Gryffindor Quidditch team. But I just think this is just a terrible start to his week because first he has to deal with Snape and then a couple of days later, he has to deal with Draco. And these are like the two characters who you would not want to be targeted by out of everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's like, okay, Snape is the next Death Eater. Malfoy's dad is a Death Eater. It's like, you don't want to get on the side of anybody who's close to the Death Eaters. And they're just not nice people at all. No, they're terrible. That's why they're called Death Eaters. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> It's interesting that Draco is mean to Neville, even though, like Draco, Neville is a pureblood. Yeah, because he, even though it it goes beyond blood status for him, it's more like your standing in the wizarding world and what you believe in. Just like with the Weasleys being, um, like, what do they call them? Blood traitors, because they don't mind muggles. Yeah, exactly. So the next time we see Neville is poor Neville gets dragged into the whole Midnight Dole mess because he forgot the password and he's sleeping outside the Fat Lady's portrait to get into Gryffindor Tower. And when Harry, Ron, and Hermione come out, Neville's like, don't leave me, don't leave me. So he tags along. Obviously, this whole thing was a setup. Filch goes after them because he was tipped off and they end up in the Unforbidden Corridor with Fluffy. So obviously they all freak and Neville is described as looking like he'll never speak again, which I agree. Um, And so this is the first of many instances where Neville kind of finds himself in a situation by accident and doesn't really want to be stuck in that situation. I do like how he's always like with the trio in some kind of way. That way, like leading up to seven, like it's completely natural for Harry to ask for him to kill Nagini. Yeah. And what's interesting, too, is that Neville starts off as a follower and then he also becomes more of a leader towards the end. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Especially when he gets kicked out of Hogwarts and well, he doesn't get kicked out. 
he leaves Hogwarts in seven because the Caros were going to kill him. Like, so he completely like flips and becomes who he really like is in life. Definitely. So the next thing that happens is Draco hits Neville with the leg locker curse. And I think that this is a very significant part, even though it seems that it might not be. So when Neville comes into the common room, his legs are stuck together. Hermione performs a counter curse and tells him to go talk to McGonagall. And Neville was like, no. And then Ron <laughs> basically tells him, like, you have to stand up to him. Like, don't let him walk all over you. Don't make it easy. And Neville, I think, shows a lot of bravery here because he tells Ron off, kind of. <laughs> and he says... There's no reason to tell me I'm not brave enough to be in Gryffindor. Malfoy's already done that. Shout out to you for, you know, doing that. And then Harry has this really nice thing to say. You're worth 12 of Malfoy. The Sorting Hat chose you for Gryffindor, didn't it? And where's Malfoy in stinking Slytherin? <laughs> and then he gives him one of his chocolate frogs. And Neville, knowing that Harry likes to collect the cards, thanks him and gives him the card that was in the chocolate frog so i love this whole thing because harry is showing kindness to neville neville is starting to get a little bit of bravery in a way like telling ron this um and this whole part kind of fuels i think his ability to start to stand up to people mm -hmm. definitely soon after this we have the gryffindor versus hufflepuff quidditch match and Ron and Neville are sitting together, and Draco, Crabbe, and Goyle come too, which straight up is, like, not good at all. So, Draco has something to say about the Weasleys, Harry, and Neville, which, again, Draco not being nice. You know how I think they choose people for the Gryffindor team? It's people they feel sorry for. See, there's Potter, who's got no parents. Then there's the Weasleys, who've got no money. You should be on the team Longbottom, you've got no brains. Which, ouch. And then Neville is like, I'm worth 12 of you, Malfoy. Which, yes. But Draco's not done yet, because then he says, Longbottom, if brains were gold, you'd be poorer than Weasley, and that's saying something. Not cool. And then at this point, Harry goes into a dive because he's seen the snitch, and Draco is basically saying, oh, it looks like Potter spotted some money on the ground. You're in luck, Weasley. And then Ron goes out Malfoy, and Neville takes on Crab and Goyle single-handedly. Yes, he ends up knocked out cold in the hospital wing for a while, but, I mean... Bravery here, taking on these two. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, he's braver than I was at 11. I'd be so scared. You know, think about this. He's only 11 years old, and he's taking on these guys who are twice his size almost, and there's two of them. I couldn't do that. That's pure bravery right there. This is also my favorite part in Sorcerer's Stone, because he says it timidly that he's worth 12 of them, but then he, like gets up the nerve and just starts trying to beat them up how can you not stand neville i'm sorry guys <laughs> people who don't stand neville you're losing <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> So earlier we were talking about how Neville kind of finds himself in situations without, you know, meaning to be caught up in them. And another time this happens is the whole detention and then forbidden forest thing after Harry and Hermione are trying to smuggle Norbert up to the highest tower so Charlie can take him away. So Draco obviously knows about the dragon and Neville hears Draco talking about Potter's got a dragon. So Neville comes to warn them but obviously this doesn't work out because McGonagall catches him and he gets attention too. To make it even worse he's sent into the Forbidden Forest with the others and he's first paired up with Draco and Draco being Draco has to like sneak up behind him and grab him and Neville gets totally freaked out and sends up Red Spark. So I I mean I would too if you're in the forest and you're looking for this hurt unicorn and you don't know like what is out there and somebody grabs you from behind, I'd send up Red Sparks too, one hundred percent. So I don't blame Neville here for, you know, freaking out. 
And, like, honestly, like, what was the point? Like, why did Draco have to do this? Like, it was so unnecessary. I mean, that's what we were talking about in our Draco episode. He's super extra. (laughs) Kids do some really weird things. Like, um, so for those of you who don't know, I am a first grade teacher. And sometimes kids just try things out. They're like little scientists with behaviors. So they'll just try things like and I can even see it like with my own daughter. She just she look at you and just try something just to see what the reaction is. So like I think Draco is constantly like pushing that boundary line like, OK, what can I get away with now? That's a really good perspective. Oh, you're so good because <laughs> you have all these like different perspectives. I love it. Oh, yeah, thanks. I love it, too. It's awesome. Thanks. You guys are like filling me up. <laughs> so the last part on Sorcerer's Stone is, hands down, one of my favorite things that happens to Neville in the whole series at the very end. So before his big shining moment, he's in the common room, and this is when Harry, Hermione, and Ron are going to sneak out to go after what they think is Snape to get to the Sorcerer's Stone, and Neville, like, is not letting them go. He's like, I'm not gonna let you go. Like, fight me. Like, you're gonna get Gryffindor in trouble again. You can't go out. And they're basically like, seriously, Neville, just move. And Ron calls him an idiot. He's like, don't be an idiot, Neville. And Neville's like, I'm not an idiot. And then he basically tells Ron that, like, he's the one who told him to stand up for people. And Ron's like, yeah, well, not to us, which come on, Ron, like, you deserve it if you're calling him an idiot, so he had every right to stand up for himself here, um, and then he blocks the portrait hole, and then is basically telling Ron to fight him, Hermione hits him with Petrificus Totalis, and I feel bad for Neville, because, you know, he was trying to, you know, do the right thing for what he believed for Gryffindor, and, I get what Hermione did here because she didn't want him to get caught up in another thing. He already got caught up with the whole thing with Fluffy and then in the forest. Like, he did not want to be involved with this. So she got him out of that. But the greatest thing ever is that at the final feast when the House Cup is being awarded, Harry, Ron, and Hermione obviously get 50 points each. And they are tied with Slytherin at that point. And guess who gets the last 10 points and wins the House Cup for Gryffindor? (laughs) Neville. And I love what Dumbledore says. It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. I therefore award 10 points to Mr. Neville Longbottom. So Neville wins the House Cup for them. And this is a great way for him to end his first year because he's definitely had a rough one. That start to it was terrible throughout. He had all these scrambles and he was victorious at the end. So I love how this book has a great arc for his character. In this book, he obviously has enemies like Draco and Snape, but now he also has a support system because from then on, he's good friends with the trio and he also now feels like he belongs at Hogwarts because of what Dumbledore said. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So, in Chamber of Secrets, we start off when Ron receives a howler um, from Mrs. Weasley for taking Harry in Mr. Weasley's magical flying car to Hogwarts, and then obviously they crash into the Whomping Willow. So, at the breakfast table, Neville talks to Ron about the time his grand sent him a howler, and this is what he says. "'You better open it, Ron,' said Neville in a timid whisper. "'It'll be worse if you don't. My grand sent me one once, and I ignored it, and he gulped. It was horrible. And then after he says this, he stuffs his fingers in his ears when Ron opens the howler. So this part is significant because we see, again, his relationship with his grand and how hard she is on him for the simplest things. You know, she gets angry when he forgets something. She's not very confident in Neville's magical abilities. So this part is just another glimpse into their relationship. Yeah, this kind of has the same kind of thing. Like, I have an older sister, and we did, like, a lot of the same things, and um, I, it was the kind of thing, like, she did it first, so just because I did it, 
it wasn't as big of a deal or if I didn't do it as good of her it was noticeable and I feel like this is the same kind of thing with like his dad being an amazing or an amazing wizard and Neville not living up to those expectations so I totally relate to how Neville feels and his grand really needs to realize that Neville is not his dad he's his Mm -hmm. own person yeah and he can you know he can do as good or as bad as he is able to do completely so we have two more things in chamber of secrets to look at and they both happen in the dueling club chapter so in this part people around the school are freaking out about the air slytherin and they're freaking out about who's going to be targeted next especially muggleborns people are selling talismans amulets and other protective items neville longbottom bought a large evil smelling green onion a pointed purple crystal, and a rotting newt tail before the other Gryffindor boys pointed out that he was in no danger, he was a pureblood, and therefore unlikely to be attacked. They went for Filch first, Neville said, his round face fearful, and everyone knows I'm almost a squib. He's not almost a squib, okay? The only reason why he feels that way is because his, his family kept putting that pressure on him that he needed to be insanely magical and the magical abilities he can do isn't good enough for them yep you're not wrong like we said earlier his confidence is shattered by the people who bully him and he doesn't believe in himself yet he's drilled to believe that he's not good enough this next part breaks my heart a little bit so in the dueling club Lockhart wants to demonstrate to everyone how to block unfriendly spells, which obviously he can't do, but anyways. He picks Neville and Justin Finch Fletchley, but Snape says that this is a bad idea. Longbottom causes devastation with the simplest spells. We'll be sending what's left of Finch Fletchley up to the hospital wing in a matchbox. Neville's face goes pink, and then Snape suggests Malfoy and Harry do the demonstration instead, which Lockhart agrees on. This is terrible! This is another scene where his confidence is shattered even more. Like, if he tried harder, he could probably do the spell. It's because Snape is around, and Snape, every time he's around, Neville is terrified, and just everything that he can do at all of his abilities he just thinks he can't because it just goes down the drain also snape makes a huge overgeneralization here because he mostly sees neville in potions so just because you're bad at one thing doesn't mean you're bad at everything i can't yeah. stand how snape treats him yeah it's pretty bad so neville and his third year of hogwarts is not really where we see him reaching his full potential he's constantly being put down by certain professors, peers, and even himself. But like I said earlier, like we can learn a lot about the way that we treat children, like especially as like teachers, parents, and caregivers, and how that can go into affecting children, their confidence, their mindset, and even how they view themselves. So just keep that in mind as you know we dive deeper into Neville's character. So Neville kicks off his third year at Hogwarts with the Golden Trio and Ginny on the train when a Dementor enters into their compartment. And this sends Harry into his like, I said sends Harry into his Horcrux, but that's like not canon speaking. But he, you know, he hears his mom (laughs) screaming and all of that. But So after that, because Neville was there, unfortunately, he is the one who told people about what happened in the compartment, not at all purposefully trying to hurt anyone, but that's how Malfoy gets the information, and that's why Malfoy, you know, starts to, like, tease and bully Harry about Dementors, and we see that as, like, a little bit of a theme later on through the book, like, wearing the hoods at... You know, the Quidditch match and all of that where um, Harry actually um, does expect a Patronum on him. That's great. I love that. It also makes me laugh because Fred and George 
are at the Gryffindor table in the beginning, and they're like, you know, why is Malfoy making fun of Harry? He was pretty scared on the train. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. So, in the first divination class of the year, Neville breaks two teacups that belong to Professor Trelawney. Um, so, there's just, like, little mentions of him throughout this book. Um during care of magical creatures, Neville kept backing away as he was bowing to the hippogriff, but that made the hippogriff not want to bow back. So he wasn't able to like approach or anything. Um, so we see that he's not fully his brave self just yet. So then here's um, a nice potions class for us, right? Everybody loves potions with Professor Snape. So the following day... Neville and Harry are usually always at the receiving end of Snape's wrath because, like I said, probably the prophecy and the possibility of the long bottoms. And, oh, I did ask a question right here because, you know, that's what I do. I ask questions as I go. But do you, did Neville ever find out about the prophecy, possibly meaning him? Like, let's, we can answer that later on when we talk about five. But I just thought that that was interesting. Like, did he ever know? I don't think. I don't think so either. Yeah, that's what's baffling is that Harry finds all this stuff out from Dumbledore and some of it he shares and most of it he doesn't, which one of which is the prophecy. Right. I feel like since it involves him, he should have figured he should have known. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I like I feel like if he would have found out later on, it maybe would have like really like given him a complex, like messed him up a little bit. Like, knowing that that could have been all on him and he could have done more. Because I feel like he's that kind of person, like Harry. Like, he always feels like he could do more. Even in certain circumstances where, like, you can't do more. You've done everything you could do. Like, yeah. I don't know. I just feel like he's that type of, of good guy. Yeah, definitely. I agree. I agree. 100%. <laughs> so, during potions class, they were composing a shrinking solution, which was um, supposed to be orange. Oh, I'm sorry. It was orange, but it was supposed to be green. And Snape wanted to pressure Neville into getting the potion correct. So he told him that he was going to feed some of the potion to his toe, Trevor, at the end of class. So this obviously freaks him out. So Hermione ends up like whispering to Neville, like how to do certain things. And by the end of class, the potion was fine, and Trevor was successfully turned back into a tadpole again. But because Snape said Hermione was helping him, which she was, but whatever, the Gryffindors lost five points because of that. But, like, you can see if Neville has a teacher, Hermione, that he's not afraid of, he's not bad at potions. She wasn't physically doing it for him. She was instructing him on how to do it. And if you have proper instruction, then your result is going to be positive. So you can see how Neville has that potential to be good or decent at potions. The problem is Snape. <laughs> yeah, this is hands down one of my least favorite Snape and Neville moments because it's just cruel. And yeah, I agree. Like, he never had any sort of support, instruction, or anything from Snape. He never had any encouragement, and it stumps his abilities and potions. Mm -hmm. I agree. And you can even see this with Harry in Six. Like, um, Slughorn's the potions master in Six, but Harry is still learning from Snape via, you know, his Half-Blood Prince writings in the potion book. And so it's still Snape teaching, but there's that pressure that's not there. There's not that Snape looming in the background, like kind of like terrifying him and he's able to focus more. And it's the same thing with both of these two. Harry and Neville are very much alike. Yeah, it's literally like Snape's presence. Like anytime he walks in a room, like it's his presence alone that causes the terror in them. Yeah, it is. When you're afraid, you kind of have, like, a fight-or-flight response, and Neville obviously wants to flee, so when your emotion of fear is clouding your brain, that's really all you can think about. 
So if all you can think about is running away from something that scares you, then obviously you're not going to do well. Yep, exactly. That's why teachers are very important because there's like, there's such an influence on kids. Like we need quality teachers. So we're going to come across a quality teacher here. So later on in that same day, Neville had his first practical of Defense Against the Dark Arts with Professor Lupin. Um, And this lesson was all about Boggarts. And Neville was the first person to come up using him as an example for what they were doing. So Neville needed to gain some confidence. And I feel like Lupin saw that in him. And in this moment, it had to be like he had to be feeling so much braver than he thought he was because he's in front of everyone and he has to talk about the thing that he fears the most. Like how embarrassing is that? But he still does it and he still says it. So we find out that Professor Snape is the thing or person that scares him the most. And I said, imagine having to see him so much. Like every day he has to see him and have class with him. Not every day, but like, a ton of days during the week and you have to be with the thing that you fear the most. That's crazy. It's also humiliating for Snape because the rumor spreads across the school about it, which is my favorite part is like Neville's able to face his fear and his fear knows about it and he can't handle the embarrassment of what he looked like in his grandmother's clothes. (laughs) It's priceless. Speaking of grandmother's clothes, there's like that meme that goes around and it's Snape dressed as Neville's grandma and it's that, that, what is it, Macklemore song? Like, I wear your grandma's clothes. I look incredible. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it so much. To get rid of this bog art, Neville pictures Snape wearing his grandmother's clothes to enable him to successfully banish it. It works. And Neville earns the Gryffindors 10 points. And I can only imagine how, like, awesome he felt earning the Gryffindors points. He got those five back that he lost earlier and then an extra five. In spring of his third year, Neville had been writing down the passwords for Gryffindor Tower because he couldn't remember them. And he lost them. And this is how Sirius was able to enter the tower. And he was severely punished for this by McGonagall. He wasn't able to go to Hogsmeade. He had detention. And he couldn't have the passwords anymore. So he had to wait for someone every time he wanted to get into the tower. And I thought that this was kind of unfair especially the last one like that just is sad um because crookshanks actually stole those passwords <laughs> and it wasn't his fault yeah and i honestly like mcgonagall is one of my favorite teachers and you can't really get mad at her here for like punishing neville and not giving him any of the any of the passwords anymore because she was trying to protect all the students you know what i mean So I get what she did, but I feel like it could have been done a little bit differently as to not completely, like, shut Neville down. I feel like maybe he should have had somebody assigned to him to, like, maybe, like, let him into the tower instead of just making him, like, sit there and wait. Like, why couldn't somebody, like, like, if he needed them, why couldn't he go, like, say, McGonagall, can you come with me? But, like, also, if you say the password out loud, he's going to know it. It's just weird. (laughs) I don't get how it worked. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and also, like, you know, when you can't remember something, you write it down. So he had a solid plan. His problem was he just lost the parchment because he forgets things. So two days after this, his grand sends him a howler to the Great Hall saying that he brought, quote, shame to his family. And I thought that was, ugh, sad. And then the last we hear from Neville in his third year is after his divination final. And he is told that if he tells anyone his results, he would suffer a serious accident. (laughs) And I said, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) How is that a prediction anyway? Because 99% chance that that's going to (laughs) happen. I know. He's always hurting himself. (laughs) The first biggest moment with Neville and Goblet of Fire is Moody's Defense Against the Dark Arts lesson when he's teaching them about the unforgivable curses. So he asked the class if anybody knows any illegal curses and Ron is first to say that 
One is the Imperius Curse, and his dad told him about this one. So Moody has brought along a jar of spiders for the lesson to demonstrate the curses. So he demonstrates the Imperius Curse, and then after this, he asks them if anybody else knows any other curses. And to Harry's surprise, Neville raises his hand and says that one is the Cruciatus Curse. And Moody kind of looks at him intently and is like, your name's Longbottom? Which is big because, you know, obviously he knows, I mean, we know he's Crouch, but either way, Moody and Buttercup Jr. both know what happened to Neville's parents. And this is like an awkward moment because the rest of the class is kind of shocked in the first place that Neville raised his hand. And now Moody's reaction is kind of odd too. But he demonstrates the Cruciatus curse, and Hermione yelled at him to stop. And this is what the book says. Neville's hands were clutched upon the desk in front of him, his knuckles white, his eyes wide and horrified. So imagine knowing that your parents were tortured by this curse, and actually sitting in a class full of your peers watching the same thing happened to a spider and knowing that is how your parents lost their minds. Yeah, that's really sad. It's like almost a form of torture for him. Yeah, I know it's supposed to be a lesson for the students, but reliving that trauma is also terrible. Like, I can't imagine what he was thinking or feeling during that time. So obviously after this, the last curse is the Vatacadavra, which Hermione says, and the last spider gets killed with that curse and Harry isn't feeling too great either. So after the demonstrations, Moody tells them that using one of the curses will give you a life sentence in Azkaban and then they spend the rest of the lesson copying down what all the curses are and taking notes on them. After the class, Neville is still super shaken up over this and Hermione's asking him if he's okay and Neville says he's fine but clearly he's not. And he's stammering and everything. And this is when Moody comes over and tells him, come to my office, you know, let's let's have a cup of tea. And he tells him that he has books that might interest him. So later that day after dinner, Harry and Ron go up to their dormitory and Neville is sitting on his bed reading. He looks better than he did before, but his eyes are still red as though he's been crying. And... He shows them the book that Moody lent him, which is called Magical Water Plants of the Mediterranean. And then he says something that makes my heart so, so, so happy. Apparently, Professor Sprout told Professor Moody I'm really good at herbology. Which, shout out to Sprout here, you know, head of Hufflepuff House, my house. She is so kind and supportive of her students, unlike other professors we know. (laughs) Snape. Neville rarely is told that he's good at anything, and receiving a compliment like this is just incredible. And it even says in a book that when he says this, he has a note of pride in his voice. So this is a great moment here, I think. Yeah, and I mean, like any other student, you know, they deserve to be encouraged. They deserve to be complimented. And the fact that Professor Sprout is able to be that kind of teacher to Neville especially when he needs that teacher and that person to encourage him. That's super important. Well, I think that Professor Sprout also inspires him for, you know, his career path later on in life. He also becomes a professor. Yeah, I love Professor Sprout. She didn't get the recognition she deserves. I feel like she deserves more recognition. Mm -hmm. So the next little bit we have in Goblet is after the first task and Harry has his golden egg All the Gryffindors are in the common room and they're telling him to open it. And when he does, it has that wailing sound and he slams it shut. And then everybody starts to share their ideas of what the second task could possibly be based on the wailing. And Neville is one of them. And he says, it was someone being tortured. You're going to have to fight the Cruciatus curse. Which obviously George is like, don't be a prat. That's illegal. But given everything that we just talked about with the Defense Against the Dark Arts lesson with Moody, this is clearly on his mind still after that lesson. And given that the first thing he thinks of when he heard the wailing from the egg is a Cruciatus curse and his parents, again, he's still very traumatized by it. And it is on his mind a lot. 
I feel so bad for him. Uh, and it's like none of the other students know. Like at this point, Harry doesn't even know. So it's just interesting to like see their reactions because, you know, someone who doesn't have an experience with the Christian curse, like Neville does because of his parents, saying that like and just making fun of that idea how George did, it probably wouldn't have been a big deal. But because of what Neville experienced and they don't know that, it's kind of interesting to see like how that dynamic is. It also just shows how often Neville is brushed aside. Like what he says sometimes doesn't matter to people. And that's another instance where I feel sorry for him because he deserves to be heard. Yeah, and because of the way that he is treated, like if he had closer friends, this would have been a time to be like, oh, by the way, like, you know, my parents were tortured by the Christianity's curse. But because he doesn't have that relationship with any of them and he doesn't feel like he can be open, he keeps that to himself. So the last part in Galba that we're going to talk about is kind of indirectly with Neville because he isn't actually in the scene, but this is after Harry sees the memory and the pensive of Crouch's trial. And they're talking about Neville's parents and what happened to them. And Harry asked Dumbledore, you know, were they talking about Neville's parents? And Dumbledore is kind of surprised and is like, what, like, Neville never told you why he was brought up by his grandmother? And Harry's like, no. And then this is a moment here, kind of going back to what Jess was saying about, you know, him kind of being brushed aside. Um, Harry kind of thinks to himself about how he couldn't have asked him. I mean, he's known him for almost four years. And Harry wonders why he never asked Neville why his grandmother brought him up. So I think this is a big eye-opener for Harry right here. Because afterward, Dumbledore tells him the truth about Neville's parents and about how Bellatrix tortured them with the Christianity curse to get information about Voldemort after he lost his powers. And when Harry's leaving, Dumbledore tells Harry not to share the information with anyone because Neville has the right to tell everybody when he's ready. So I, this is a very significant scene, I feel like, because we both see Harry kind of feeling guilty in a way and also Neville not telling anybody yet because he doesn't feel comfortable. And he isn't going to tell anybody because he still doesn't have that trust in his friends. And also telling people means that he has to face it and he has to come to terms with what happened to his parents. And, you know, he's not ready for that. No. He's not ready for that yet. And that's important to know. Mm-mm. Yeah. So the first time we see Neville in Order of the Phoenix is when he and Ginny and Harry are looking for a compartment on the Hogwarts Express and they run into Luna. And Luna allows them to sit with them, and Ginny asks Luna about her summer. Luna says that it was enjoyable. Then she sees Harry and says, you're Harry Potter. Harry says, I know I am. Neville laughs at this. Luna looks at Neville and says, and I don't know who you are. I'm nobody, said Neville hurriedly. No, you're not, said Ginny sharply. Neville Longbottom, Luna Lovegood. This is super important because before we were talking about how Neville isn't confident in himself and this just shows it. He doesn't even think he's worth recognizing. But Ginny is there and she negates Neville's feelings by introducing him, by saying that he is important and he is worthy of recognition. So shout out to Ginny because she's awesome and she is like the queen of sticking up for people. This is one of my favorite Ginny moments also. This part also emphasizes how back in Goblet, Neville and Ginny went to the Yule Ball together. And it's nice to see how Ginny is kind of somebody who is there for Neville and kind of sees him as a significant person and as a friend to stand up for and to support. So I love their little relationship. I do too. I love just the way that Ginny, like, finds her own and starts to stand up for people. Yeah, and their little time on the train continues when Neville shows them his 
membulus membletonia. He prods it with the tip of his quill and stink sap comes out, spraying everybody. Now, this is a little bit embarrassing for Harry because Cho Chang comes in. She goes, hi, Harry. And she notices what's going on and goes, okay, I'm going to leave now. So she leaves. Harry's embarrassed. Neville's apologizing, poor kid, because he didn't really know that all of this sap was going to come out. I mean, maybe a stream would, but not all this much. But Ginny is not for that. She's not for him apologizing. Like, messes happen, things happen. Never mind, said Ginny bracingly. Look, we can get rid of all this easily. And then she does the Scourgeify spell. I love Ginny so much. <laughs> and she's constantly trying to make Neville feel better and not as small, and I love it. Yes. Here's another awesome McGonagall moment. So at the beginning of the semester, she's talking to her transfiguration class about OWLs. I see no reason why everybody in this class should not achieve an OWL in transfiguration, as long as they put in the work. Neville made a sad little disbelieving noise. Yes, you too, Longbottom, said Professor McGonagall. There's nothing wrong with your work except lack of confidence. This is important because now another teacher is encouraging Neville. I also think it's really significant that it's McGonagall because she is stern, but she cares very deeply for her students. And she's also his head of house. So that's probably very, very important for Neville to be encouraged by her specifically. So the trio run into Draco Malfoy outside of potions, and he's bragging about how Umbridge gave the Slytherin team permission to play Quidditch. He said it's all because Umbridge knows his father, as he's always at the ministry. He also says that it'll be interesting to see if Gryffindor will be allowed to keep playing. If it's a question of influence with the ministry, I don't think they've got much chance. From what my father says, They've been looking for an excuse to sack Arthur Weasley for years. And as for Potter, my father says it's a matter of time before the ministry has him carted off to St. Mungo's. Apparently, they've got a special ward for people whose brains have been addled by magic. He also has to top it off with a face because he's extra. Right. Malfoy made a grotesque face, his mouth sagging open and his eyes rolling. So... After that, something collided with Harry's shoulder, and he's knocked sideways. Harry realizes that Neville is charging past him toward Malfoy. Harry tells Neville no, and he seizes the back of Neville's robes. Neville struggled frantically, his fists flailing, trying desperately to get at Malfoy, who looked for a moment extremely shocked. Harry tells Ron to help him with Neville, and Harry flings an arm around Neville's neck, and he drags him backward. Crab and Goyle step forward in front of Malfoy, but Ron grabs Neville's arms, and they manage to get him back in the Gryffindor line. Neville's face was scarlet. The pressure Harry was exerting on his throat rendered him quite incomprehensible, but odd words spluttered from his mouth. Not funny. Don't. Mungo's show him. Snape comes out of his classroom at the perfect time, and he sees the commotion. He takes 10 points from Gryffindor, as is his custom, and he tells Harry to release Neville or it would be detention for Harry. So Harry lets go of Neville, and Harry says, I had to stop you. Harry snapped, picking up his bag. Crab and Goyle would have torn you apart. This is when Neville says nothing and grabs his bag. He leaves and goes into the classroom. So this part is important for multiple reasons. One, because Malfoy doesn't know what he said to hurt Neville because no one knows about his parents. Two, Draco was actually trying to insult Harry here. And to his delight, he insults two people, Harry and Neville. But it's Neville who steps up to fight Malfoy instead of Harry because Harry usually does fight Malfoy. So that part is important. And also... This is the f one of the first times um, in the later books that Neville actually stands up to Malfoy and he tries to fight him. If Neville had been released and Harry hadn't caught him, we really don't know what would have happened in the fight. But this is another insult to Neville because Harry's basically saying, well, you can't take him on. So Malfoy just insulted Neville 
about his parents and then Harry has to add to it. We were talking about this last night. It's just so sad. His reaction is so sad. And then we were talking about Malfoy's reaction too because it said he looked like shocked. So I was wondering like was Malfoy shocked because Neville actually like did something or like because we just wonder if Neville or if Malfoy knew about Neville's parents in any kind of way. Because his dad, I mean, is a Death Eater. And his aunt is the one who was part of the torturing. Part of me thinks that Draco does know. Maybe he doesn't know, like, specifics. But given that Bellatrix is his aunt, I feel like Draco would at least know that she tortured... Neville's parents with the Cruciatus curse. I feel like that'd be something that was talked about in his family that he would have known. But in that instance, like Jess was saying, like I don't think he was intending that to be said at Neville because he was talking to Harry, but indirectly it affected Neville. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think he might have known. I'm not 100% sure though. There's no way to know that for sure, but it's interesting. Right. I mean, and part of me thinks that he doesn't because of the shock. Yeah. Yeah. Or it could have been just shock, like you were saying, of the fact that Neville was charging him. So it's interesting to see, like, what his shock was representing. Yeah. You don't know. Questions, questions. Mm-hmm. So it's worth mentioning here that in our last episode, we talked all about Thestrals. And we talked about how Neville could see them during Hagrid's Care of Magical Creatures class. Neville told Umbridge he wasn't afraid of the Thestrals. And that he could see them because his granddad died. In Goblet of Fire, Dumbledore tells Harry that Neville goes to see his parents at St. Mungo's. So later on in the book, after Arthur Weasley was bitten by the snake and they're all there, Hermione, Harry, Ron, and Ginny run into Neville at Christmas at St. Mungo's. This is a really tense and emotional moment for Neville because he basically has to confront the trio and Ginny about his parents and he has to cope with the loss of his parents at such a young age and his grandmother puts pressure on him like we said to be like his father and as readers we start rooting for Neville we want him to succeed we want him to show his grandmother that he is a good wizard one of my favorite parts of this book is how Neville excels at the DA meetings So when Harry begins teaching the DA um, for the first time, Neville has no partner, so Harry pairs up with him and they practice disarming charms. When Harry is looking in another direction, Neville disarms him and this is a huge uh, victory for Neville because he's not very good at spell work and the fact that he's successful is just awesome. And then later he's able to disarm Hermione And then he masters the impediment jinx, and he's able to freeze Harry. He gets better at the stunning spell. The book says, True, Neville did stun Padma Patil rather than Dean, at whom he had been aiming, but it was a much closer miss than usual. So this is awesome. He's getting a little bit more accurate. And then later on, after the Christmas holiday... He was improving so fast, it was quite unnerving, and when Harry taught them the shield charm, a means of deflecting minor jinxes so that they rebounded upon the attacker, only Hermione mastered the charm faster than Neville. It's also significant that in the DA classes, Harry teaches them about Patronus charms. Neville is having trouble producing a Patronus. Only feeble whiffs of smoke come out of his wand tip. You've got to think of something happy, Harry reminded him. I'm trying, said Neville miserably, who was trying so hard his round face was actually shining with sweat. I wonder if after the Battle of Hogwarts, when Neville is super victorious and everything, I wonder if he's able to produce a Patronus after that because of how he succeeded. Does he produce one during the battle? Some of the DA members use their Patronuses to help the trio get through the Whomping Willow to find Voldemort in the Shrieking Shack. Yeah, but I think the only ones described in the book of showing up to help them are Luna, Seamus, and Ernie. 
those were the three that came to help them. So I don't know if Neville actually produced one in the battle because it was never described that he was one of them. Okay, yeah, you're right. The next time we see Neville is when they go to the Ministry of Magic because Harry believes that Sirius is being tortured in the Department of Mysteries. Once they get there, they get to the door that Harry has been dreaming about, and Harry says that some of them should stay behind as a lookout. Neville says, we're coming with you, Harry. So Neville is determined to help in this mission, and he keeps the whole group together, which shows leadership and bravery. Like, he is not going to stay behind. The group makes it to the Hall of Prophecies, and they go to row 97. It's there that they see the prophecy that has Harry's name on it. So Harry goes to grab it, but Neville tells him not to. It's interesting in this part because Neville got bad vibes from this prophecy, and obviously he's feeling anxious from the complete strangeness of the situation, but given that the prophecy technically refers to Neville to before Harry was marked as Voldemort's equal, this makes a fascinating moment. It's kind of weird because kind of how we were talking about earlier, Neville didn't know about the prophecy, but this kind of shows a little bit of like, maybe he got a feeling about it, but didn't know what exactly was going on, but he got some kind of feeling that there was something significant about that prophecy. Like you said, it's a fascinating moment because there's so many different like moving pieces and parts to um the choices that we made and the repercussions of those choices and it 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 easily could have been neville as well so the death eaters show up and harry gives the order and neville says reducto neville harry and hermione find themselves in the time room and a death eater tries to hit hermione with the with the killing curse so harry launches himself forward and he grabs the death eater around the knees when Neville shoots Expelliarmus. Unfortunately, Harry gets disarmed too, but Neville was able to perform the spell and he prevented him from possibly trying to use the killing curse again. After that, Neville, Harry, and Hermione get hit with impedimenta and Hermione gets hit with with the purple flashes that shoot from Dullhove's wand, which makes her collapse. Neville goes over to her and Dolhoff kicks at Neville's head. So his foot breaks Neville's wand and slams into his face, which gives him a broken nose. Poor kid. So after that, Harry tells Neville to stay with Hermione, but Neville is determined to help Harry. So he says they'll take Hermione with them. Then when Harry gives Neville Hermione's wand to use, Neville tells him that his gran is gonna kill him because his wand that broke was his dad's old wand. So we all know from book one that the wand chooses a wizard. Neville was given his dad's wand. I understand why his grandmother did it. It was a nice thing to do and it was a good way to kind of let his dad's legacy live on. But at the same time, that wand did not choose him. So this just makes me really wonder if Neville had been chosen by his own wand before starting at Hogwarts, if he would have been better at magic. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind, especially the way that we find out how wands work in Seven and the importance of somebody being the true master of a wand. Um, There's no doubt in my mind. And if you have to think about the magic that Neville is doing with his father's wand and imagine what his magic could be had he had a wand choose him before all of this. Um, He wouldn't have had such a hard time getting started at Hogwarts. And I'm just glad that, you know, after this, he eventually gets his own and has a wand choose him. And that also brings me back to the question about the Patronus. It's like, I wonder if once he got his new wand and practiced, if later on in life he did... He, if he was able to produce one. Eventually, Harry and Neville are the only two left who are able to fight. Neville tries to use the stunning spell, but since his nose is broken, it doesn't work. Eventually, Bellatrix comes over. She uses the Cruciatus Kurt's curse and threatens to curse Neville some more if Harry doesn't hand over the prophecy. Harry doesn't hesitate to do this, um, but when he's about to hand it over, that's when the Order of the Phoenix shows up. 
When McNair has a hold on Harry and he's trying to get the prophecy, Neville pulls a fantastic move by jabbing Hermione's wand in the eye hole of McNair's mask. Then Dolohoff hits Neville with the Tarantalegra curse, which makes Neville's legs go into a kind of frenzied dance. Harry's trying to help Neville up the steps, but then Lucius shows up and tries to go after Harry for the prophecy. Um, he throws the prophecy to Neville and tells Neville to catch it. Then Harry and Neville are climbing the steps again, and Neville puts it in his pocket. But as they're struggling to climb higher, Neville's robes rip, and the prophecy falls, and one of Neville's thrashing feet kicks it. So the prophecy smashes. The prophecy is then spoken by a white figure, but no one hears it. Neville did fantastic in this battle. Like, he might not feel like he did, but he really played his part. Yeah, and it's super important that the Death Eaters don't hear the rest of that prophecy. So, it's kind of ironic that, like we were talking about, the prophecy has Neville in it, but Neville doesn't know, and he's basically holding something that could tell him something, but he never finds out because he breaks it. After the Battle of the Department of Mysteries is over, Harry goes into Dumbledore's office, and that's where he finds out about the prophecy. So, in Neville's sixth year, he sits down with Luna and Harry on the Hogwarts Express, and he is disappointed that the DA meetings are not going to be continuing this year because they don't need them anymore because Umbridge is gone. And Ramilda Vane came in the compartment, and she tried to insult Neville and Luna to look good in front of Harry, and this epically backfired against her because Harry told her that they were some of the most loyal, loyal friends that he's ever had. And I said that that's super incredibly true. Um, so on the train, Neville is also invited to join Slughorn in his train compartment. But Neville didn't really make the cut to become a member of the Slug Club, which is lame in my opinion because he's awesome. But he does end up being a server at the Christmas party for the Slug Club, which is kind of strange. <laughs> Who would want to be a member of the Slug Club, honestly? I wouldn't want to be collected, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's just very odd. Like, yeah. I like Slughorn as a teacher, but this is just a very odd thing about him. I don't like it. Yeah. So we know a little bit about um, what Neville got as far as owls. He got at least four. Um, one outstanding, two exceeds expectations, and one acceptable. He was clear to take... Herbology, Charms, and Defense Against the Dark Arts, but he was not able to continue at the Newt level for Transfiguration. And when Neville, like, seems a little bit disappointed that he's not continuing with Transfiguration, McGonagall's kind of like, I never thought that you liked that class, pretty much. And she stands up for Neville in this moment. Neville only wants to continue on with that because of his grandmother, because she wants him to be an aura like his parents, it's problematic because that kind of thing can, you know, get inside your head and really affect your performance and your joy in life. So she basically tells him that his grandmother needs to be proud of the grandson that she has. And rightfully so. I love McGonagall here. Yeah. We don't see a whole lot of Neville in this book because mainly, you know, it's about horcruxes in Voldemort's past but we do know that at the end of the school year Neville is part of the battle of the astronomy tower he got the message on his coin that was used for the DA which I think is absolutely adorable that he still carried that around in the hopes that you know like they would get together again so he was one of the people that was standing guard outside of the room of requirement in case anything happened while Harry and Dumbledore were gone hunting the locket horcrux um, and something does happen, but Malfoy uses Peruvian instant darkness powder to avoid getting caught coming out of the room of requirement. Um, and then we find out that Neville was injured during this and that kept him up in the hospital wing for a while. He was, however, able to attend the funeral of Dumbledore and Luna helped him into his seat. So you can imagine he was, he got injured in some kind of a serious way. But he's so, like, he was a fighter, and even though he got injured, he kept fighting, you know? Like, he that didn't let him stop him. Like, after his experience with the Department of Mysteries didn't turn out perfect for him, like, that didn't shy him away from fighting again. Yeah. 
He's the perfect example of a person that falls down a bunch of times and is able to get back up again. You know, if you think about it, he's been bullied throughout these books. Uh, He's been scolded by his grandmother and he just keeps getting back up again. That's a super admirable quality. I agree. I agree. So in Deathly Hallows, obviously the trio is off hunting for Horcruxes, but while they are doing this, Neville and other DA members are back at the school fighting as hard as they can from the inside. And Neville is one of them that is truly a leader here. And when the trio is camping at a riverbank in Wales, they overhear a conversation with Fred and George's extendable ears between the goblins, Dean, Ted Tongs and Dirk, and they're talking about students who snuck into the headmaster's office and tried to steal the Sword of Gryffindor out, and they were caught by Snape as they were smuggling it out of the office. Obviously, the trio wants to know more about this, so Hermione gets Phineas Nigellus's painting out of her beaded bag that she took from Grimald Place. I love Phineas Nigellus. I love him. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, basically, he tells them that Ginny, Neville, and Luna were the ones that broke in, and he called Neville an idiot and Luna an oddity, which is awful, but Hermione sticks up for both of them. Um, (laughs) But the whole important point here is that Neville is still fighting, and he's still being a leader, and this really shows when Harry, Ron, and Hermione eventually get back into the castle. When they're with Aberforth, he tells Ariana's painting, to you know help them get in and this is when we find out that behind her painting is a passage that leads back into hogwarts and neville is the one that comes and he's looking rough like black eye scratches all over his face his hair is longer than usual his clothes are torn like he's a mess um he's super thrilled and he tells them all about how hogwarts has been the caros are in charge Amicus, who runs the Dark Guards class, makes everybody practice the Cruciatus Curse on students in detention. And Neville refused to do this, so he got a gash on his face. And then in Muggle Studies, when Electo's teaching them all about how they should hate Muggles, he stands up to her and basically asks her how much Muggle blood her and her brother got. So Neville definitely got a smart math on him now. He's standing up for himself. He's standing up for everybody else. He's being brave here. And Neville is the one that once they get back into the room of requirement and Harry, Ron, and Hermione are saying they have something they have to do, but they can't tell them. Neville's the one that is like, you know, we're part of Dumbledore's army. We've shown that we're loyal to you and Dumbledore. Let us help. Let us help. And eventually, Ron and Hermione convince Harry to give in and trust them with some information that they're looking for something to do with Ravenclaw, but don't actually say what it is. This is a big moment for Neville here because at the beginning of the books, he was kind of a follower. He was kind of scared, frightened, and now he's a leader. And because Luna got taken away from Hogwarts at Christmas and Jenny didn't come back after Easter, Neville became the true leader of everybody he was left behind. So this is just fantastic. Part of me is annoyed a little bit that Harry had to be convinced by Ron and Hermione to trust him with, like, sensitive information. I mean, here he is holding down the fort for him, and Harry hesitates. I wouldn't have hesitated. I mean, I think it's more the fact that Dumbledore didn't entrust information. Yeah, it's something he learned from Dumbledore. But then in the end, he thinks, like, he doesn't want to be like Dumbledore in that sense, and he needs to learn how to, like, open up and trust other people. It's a learned behavior for sure. Also, during this whole part in the Room of Requirement, Neville still has his golden coin from the DA to this point, and he sends a message to everybody else to come that Harry's back and we're going to fight. So Neville took it upon himself to basically recruit all the troops who are going to be fighting, which is fantastic. So when the battle starts, Neville puts his herbology skills into action because Harry sees Neville with Professor Sprout and other students running with mandrakes and they're going to lob them over the castle walls at the Death Eaters. And then down in the entrance hall... Neville has his venomous tentacula and he is throwing that at Death Eaters too, so it wraps around them. So he's doing fantastic. 
After Harry goes into the pensieve and sees Snape's memories and learns of his destiny, he's on his way out of the castle and to the Forbidden Forest when he sees Neville. Neville is one of the survivors who is looking for the bodies of the fallen fighters and taking them back into the castle. When Harry takes off his invisibility cloak, Neville is very concerned. He thinks that Harry is going to turn himself in, and Harry reassures him that it's all part of the plan because he doesn't want Neville to know that he is planning on facing his own death. But he does tell him to kill the snake. And I think this is very, very important because Dumbledore died knowing that three people knew about the Horcruxes, Harry, Ron, and Hermione. And now Harry, who is planning to die, is trusting Neville to be the third one in on the secret. So this is so amazing because only two books ago in Order of the Phoenix, Harry was hesitant to let Neville come along to the Ministry of Magic, and now he's trusting him with this very, very important task. Neville says that he will kill Nagini, and when Harry turns to go, Neville grabs his arm and says, we're all going to keep fighting, Harry, you know that. And this is such a strong moment here because it shows Neville's bravery and it shows Neville's bravery even more when he does kill Nagini, which is his greatest moment in the entire series. This is after everybody believes Harry is dead. All the Hogwartians and fighters are screaming in grief and sadness and terror and everything. And Neville's the one that comes forward. Voldemort attacks him and he falls and his wand flies out of his hand. But Voldemort basically says like, you know, you're Neville Longbottom. And you know, like you can help me. Like we need people like you on our side. And he's like, I'll join you when hell freezes over, which shout out to him for straight up saying that to the Dark Lord. And then Voldemort's like, well then, and then he conjures the sorting hat, sticks it on his head, and lights it on fire. And a ton of stuff happens at this point. Centaur join in, giants start fighting. It just becomes a total mess, but Neville takes the hat off his head and pulls from its depths the sort of Gryffindor, and he cuts off Nagini's head killing the final Horcrux and he's not done fighting yet though because once they are back in the entrance hall he is fighting Greyback the most terrible werewolf along with Ron. Even though Neville wasn't the one who was marked by Voldemort as his equal and he wasn't the chosen one Neville still played a big role in defeating part of Voldemort's soul killing Nagini and in his way he did have a place in the prophecy and in Voldemort's downfall so I love how this ends for him it's an incredible character arc Neville was my favorite character for many of the reasons that we talked about but just that he was triumphant at the end and he was able to rise above and do this incredible thing it's just fantastic Neville is the classic underdog against all odds he is able to help Harry, he's able to be a leader, and his bravery really shows at the end. Which is why a lot of people kind of overlook Neville, you know, because he's just the kid that's picked on. But really, if you take time to look into his character, he is a fantastic person. And he's really worth rooting for. I also think that at the end is when everybody kind of realizes Neville's potential and what he's capable of. And honestly, like, we all know JK's characters are so complex and they have character arcs. And from the very beginning of the series, not many people like Neville as readers. And, like, he was always one of my favorite characters because... In my head, when I started reading it the first time, I was like, no way is Neville going to be this insignificant character the whole time. He's going to change. He's going to do an amazing thing. And that's what happens. And I love how out of all the characters, I feel like Neville has one of the biggest character arcs. And we see his challenges. We see how complex and deep of a character he is. We see his flaws and we also see his strengths. So he's a very round character and I love him so much. And I hope you guys enjoyed our discussion. We are so happy that we could have Tiffany on. So, Tiffany, how did you like being our guest? I loved it, and I really appreciate you, um, you know, asking me to be on here. It was, it was a lot of fun. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you all so much again. Our next episode comes out on July 17th, and stay tuned for that. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.
Thank you for coming back to Hogwarts with us in this episode of Lumos Maxima, the Rolling Library podcast. Hedwood's theme and leaving Hogwarts in this episode were originally composed by John Williams and arranged by your favorite Hufflepuff. Until next time, three, two, one, Knox.